don't have that, okay? So there's no words limitation, no slice limitation. So how many slides you would like to prepare, really up to you. But there's time limitation. So don't go over 15 minutes, okay? So 15 minutes is a maximum time. <laughs> so 15 minutes, 10 seconds or 50 seconds, that's fine, but don't go over more than 15 minutes, say 16, 17, 18 minutes, that's not good, okay? So which means penalty may apply if you go over time, okay? <clears throat> All right, now, so now let's move on to have a look at the topic we are going to discuss today. And um, you might notice that this is actually our final topic related to consolidation. Yeah. Now today we are going to have a closure, right? So we're going to have a look at the multiple um, subsidiary group structure. Now when there's a multiple subsidiary group structure, there's need to distinguish the direct interest from indirect interest. Now let's look at the difference. You can see direct ownership interest means the parents own shares. Could be some of the shares or could be all of the share capital of a subsidiary and obtaining the controlling interest. So that is a direct ownership interest. Now indirect ownership interest, that is um, the equity in a subsidiary because this subsidiary held by one of parent subsidiary, which means um, the parents can control the other sub the subsidiary through is controlling, direct controlling of one of the subsidiary. Now we can use the following group structure to demonstrate that. Oh, we have that in the next slides, okay? So if you have a look at this group structure we have here. Now P limited group has two subsidiaries, right? Two subsidiaries, A and B. Now parents, P limited is considered as a parents entity in this group structure. A limited is a child company, okay, and B limited is a grandchild company. Okay. Now, so you can see P's ownership interest or controlling interest in A is a direct interest. That is 70% because P owns majority voting shares in A, right, directly by holding the shares. Well, P's indirect interest in B is 42%, right? So how do you find P's indirect interest in B using 70% multiplied by 60%, okay? So that is a P's indirect interest in B. Then can you tell me the percentage of the voting rights controlled by P in B limited? What is the percent percentage of the voting rights that is controlled by P in B limited? That will be? Uh, not 42, 60%. Why is that? Because P controls A, right? And A holds 60% shares in B, which in other words, P will be able to direct this 60% voting rights in B. And because this 60% represents the majority, right? So P is able to direct the relevant activities of B. Okay, so we are gonna use a different criteria to decide who to consolidate as opposed to how to consolidate. So who need to prepare consolidated statement? Assuming they are all Australian companies, that is P limited. So P as an ultimate parent in Australia, P must consolidate both A and B because P control both of these two. <coughs> so we use a control criteria to identify the parent subsidiary relationship. And such controlling interest could be direct Controlling interest, you direct holding shares in that company, right? Or may resulting from indirect uh, ownership interest, that is indirect control interest. You can say P's control interest in B is an indirect control interest, right? Now when P uh, consolidates its subsidiary B limited, now P's interest in B is only 42%. So by, by using 70% multiplied by 60%. Right? Well, the ownership interest the, the, the voting rights, sorry, the voting rights P controls in B is 60%. Okay, you see P controls 60% of the voting rights in B limited. Okay. Now, because A is a partially owned subsidiary, right? In this group structure, we have a D and C I in A. So the D and C I here, this party owns the remaining 30% shares in A limited. Okay, so the D and C I in A. And because A, acquire 60% interest in B. 
So this part Z has an indirect non-controlled interest in B, right? The D and C are in A. Now this party also has an indirect non-controlled interest in B by using 30% multiplied by 60%, that is 18%. Right. Now then you look at NCI in B limited. Now 60% shares were acquired by A, then the remaining 40% shares in B represent its direct non-controlled interest. Okay? So you can see B limited as a grandchild company in the group has both direct non-controlled interest and the indirect non-controlled interest. Okay. So for the existence of INC, uh, there are two conditions. First condition, the child company in the group must be a partially owned subsidiary. Now imagine if A is a wholly owned subsidiary, do you have NCI in A? No, not anymore, right? If there's no NCI in A, then there's no INCI in B. Okay. So the first condition, A must be a partially owned subsidiary. That's first condition. Second, A must control another entity. So you can see A controls B here, right? So A owns majority voting rights in B, and that's why there is a INCI interest in B. And the INCI in B is the same party of B and C I in A. It's represented by the same party. It is this party that has indirect non-controlled interest in B. So the total non-controlled interest in B is 58%. And parents interest in B is 42%. In total, that is 100%. So you can see each subsidiary, its ownership interest need to be divided into two parts. Parents interest, then NCI interest. And we first have to distinguish the direct interest from the indirect interest. Okay. Now we're going to show you a table later, okay? So how we are going to prepare. Hmm. Is it frozen? Okay, here we go. So we're going to prepare a table to demonstrate the ownership interest in these two subsidiary. So you can see parents interest in A, and that is a direct interest only, right? The parents directly own 70% uh, shares in A. So that we put that as a direct interest. The parents' interest in B is only indirect in our group structure. So it's only an indirect interest. And that is 42%, using 70% multiplied by 60%. Now then we look at NCI interest. The NCI interest in A is only direct interest, and that is 30%. And the NCI interest in B, uh, we have both DNCI and INCI, right? The DNCI is one minus 60%, which is 40%. And INCI is 30% multiplied by 60%, which is equal to 18%. So you can see the total NCI interest in B is 58%. That is higher, right, than the parent's interest in subsidiary B limited. So that's why the terminology minority interest we use in the past is not really appropriate because 58% is not minority, right? It's not minority. But be careful, we use different criteria to decide who to consolidate as opposed to how to consolidate, right? So use the control as a criteria to identify who to consolidate. Then if you look at the group structure, who, which entity controls A? Well, P, of course, and that is a direct control interest, right? And the which entity controls B? Uh, it seems that A controls B because A holds the majority voting right, but A is controlled by another entity, P limited, right? So you can see P becomes the ultimate parent, and P controls both A and B. So use the control criteria to identify the parent subsidiary relationship. And when we talk about controlling interest, not just direct controlling interest, we also ha have to consider if, if there's any indirect controlling interest. Now, when it comes to how to consolidate. So we have to recognize that parents' interest in B limited is only 42%. And we need to allocate B's equity 58% proportionally, right, to NCI. Okay. So you can see with the multiple subsidiary group structure, we actually have to deal with the INCI, right? Now whether the calculation of INCI is uh, different from the DNCI, so we are going to give you an example to demonstrate that. Okay. Now let's look at the following knowledge check question. 
Now in this group structure, P owns 75% of B and B owns 80% of C. Now, now first of all, diagram the group structure. So I expect you to do something similar like this, okay? So diagram the group structure, okay? And distinguish between direct interest and indirect interest here, okay? And the second requirement asks you to identify the voting rights. What voting rights does parent control in C? So what is the vote percentage voting rights, right? Parents control in C. Now let's start with the group structure. I'll give you a couple of minutes to diagram this group structure. Um, pay attention to the grant child company C Limited here. Okay? So identify both of the D and C and I and C are in C Limited. <coughs> All right, let's do this together. Uh, parent interest in D limited is 75%, right? That is a given in your question, and that is direct interest. Um, now I would like to know what about parents' interest in the grandchild company, C limited. Bess, can you tell me what is the parent's interest in C limited? Now, what about D and C I in B? Well, B only has a D and C I, right? What about D and C I in B? That would be 25 percent. Very good. So D and C I in B, right? That is 25 percent. Now, what about D and C I in C? D and C I in C is 20 percent. Now, you have I and C, right? Because this part is, has the indirect non-control. So I and C, I in C is equal to, what is I and C, I interest? Oh. 25 multiplied by 80, which is 20%. So you can see the total N, C, I in C is 40%, right? Plus the parent's interest 60%, you got 100%. Now if you look at B limited, Parents direct interest in B is 75%. NCI interest 25%. What total again? 100%. Okay. Now, so we done the first part. Now, what about the second one? What voting rights does parent control in C? 60%. Uh, what is the voting rights? The voting rights. 
the voting rights depends on the shares, right? What is the voting rights? Lanqin, what's the voting rights plus tyrant control? 80%. Because B can acquire 80% shares in C, right? And P controls B, which means P does control this 80% voting rights in C limited, okay? Well, his interest in C is 60%. When we prepare our consolidated financial information, C's equity interest, only 60% belong to the parent. 40% we allocate here in CI, okay? But when the question asks the voting rights, parents control in C, well, that is based on these 80%, okay? So let me know if you've got anything confused here, okay? 80% mm. is a voting rights. So you, you acquire 80% shares. So what's the voting <coughs> rights you have? 80%, right? Because the voting rights is, is held by B, not held directly by parents. But parents controls B. When you have voting rights of other company and I'm your parents' company, I direct that voting rights. Okay? No, 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 no. P does not hold any shares in C. P has an interest in C. The controlling interest in C through B limited. And that controlling interest is 60%. P's ability to direct 80% of the votes in C because B holds 80% shares. This is what we talk about who to consolidate as opposed to how to consolidate, right? When it comes to how to consolidate, you need to recognize peace interest in C is only 60%. That's when you apply the consolidation methods, re prepare your consolidated financial statements. C's equity, that reflected in the group equity balance, right? We need to allocate that to the parents based on 60%. doesn't matter, P controls B. What does controls mean? You have the power, right? You have the power to direct all the B's activities, including the B's voting rights in C limited. That's why P controls these 80% voting rights. Okay. All right, now let's look at this ownership structure here, right? So it's corresponding to the, to the picture we drew. Over here, so you can see parents direct interest parent in B, parents indirect interest in C, NCI in B, right? Only direct. And for NCI in C, then we have to distinguish B and C I from I and C I. Right. But you need to make sure that the total ownership interest in each company is equal to 100%. Right. This 20% or this 20%? <laughs> This one, this one minus 80%. B purchased 80% shares in C, right? The remaining 20% shares in C were held by NCI party. We call this D and C because this party owns the remaining 20% shares in C limited. Okay? Mm. All right, now let's focus the following multiple choice question. So we got the answer already, okay, very good. So the last one, right? This is the last one, so everybody agree? Now, this is the parent, right? So question here asks for the parent's indirect interest in a grandchild company. The jelly is a grandchild company in this group. So by using 90% multiplied by 60%, we should choose 54%, okay? So D is the right answer. So any question, feel free to ask. <coughs> All right, now let's look at the next one. Who is the maximum in the group? The maximum is a child company. And the question here asks for the child company's direct interest in grandchild company. I think the answer is already there, right? You don't need to do any further calculation. The answer is 60. Very good. Yeah. The child company maximums, it's 
direct interest in grand child company, Jello Limited, that is 60%. So always read the requirements carefully. Okay, so some students made a mistake, not they don't know how to do the question, it's simply because they not pay attention to the requirements in the question. Now let's look at the look at this one. DNCI, right? DNCI in grand chalk company, Jelly Limited. That will be C, right? 40%. So by using one minus 60%, that is 40%. Okay. So anyone got question? Let me know. Okay. So if you look at this diagram here, you will find maximum acquired 60% interest in Jelly. So the remaining 40% shares in Jelly is the DNCI interest, right? Okay. Now this one is a bit more challenge. Here asks for INCI in Jelly. The INCI interest in the grand child company. So someone say A. What about Jiangnan? Jiangnan is here today. You, you choose A as well? A? Okay. Very good. So A is the right answer here, right? So you can see the parents, uh, oh sorry, the INCI interest in Jelly, right? So that is the DNCI in maximum 10%. This part it has an indirect non-controlled interest in jelly. So using 10% multiply 60%, the INCI in jelly, that is 6%. Well done. Okay. All right. Now, so let's have a look at sequential acquisition. So what is a sequential acquisition? Now, if we go back to these groups, original group structure, uh, uh, I feel sorry. All right, here we go. So if you go back to this original group structure, what is sequential acquisition? P acquired A first, right? At the same time or later, A acquired its interest, controlling interest in B. Now we call this sequential acquisition. Now what is a non-sequential acquisition? A acquired B first, right? On the day when P acquired, only, uh, P acquired controlling interest in A, one of the A's assets, one of the A's asset is its investment in B limited. And that asset must be measured at fair value on the acquisition day, okay? Well, non-sequential acquisition, the RC entry is a bit more complicated compared to sequential acquisition, yeah. Now we focus on sequential acquisition, okay? Make our life a bit easy. Now for sequential acquisition, so you can see it's the ultimate parent's company, the parent's company, acquire its interest in a child company. Okay. Before or at the same time, the child company acquire its controlling interest in a grand child company, okay? Now, the, is there any change in our accounting process for the consolidation? Are they actually same, okay? Same as before. Because there are multiple subsidiaries and there are two acquisitions, right? So for each acquisition, we are going to conduct acquisition analysis, right? For the two acquisitions. For each acquisition, we need to prepare our acquisition analysis. Now your acquisition analysis, um, what depends on the goodwill method we are going to choose, whether we apply full goodwill methods or partial goodwill method, okay? Now if the question didn't tell you the NCI fair value on acquisition day, then you can only apply partial goodwill methods, okay? Uh, I can just tell you for this part, there, uh, in our example later, we are going to talk, focus on partial goodwill methods, okay? Now, and for each acquisition, you have to identify whether you need to prepare RSC entries. So whether any asset liability in the recall subsidiary is caramel different from fair value, right? And uh, whether there is any unrecorded asset liability that now it's required to be recognized as part of the asset liability for the group. Okay. Now then pre-acquisition entries. You have a two acquisition, right? You have to prepare two pre-acquisition entries. Okay. So you have to eliminate P's investment in A and also have to eliminate A's investment in B. Okay. Now these RC entries, pre-acquisition entries are exactly the same as we have previously demonstrated. So this won't be affected by the existence of NCI or by uh, or affected by um, the, 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 the multiple subsidiary group structure, right? With the existence of the INCI. It will be same as before. 
Now, the elimination of intra-group transaction does not change. Uh, still applying the same principles as we have previously explained. Full elimination is required. So you have to eliminate in for all the intergroup asset liability around the expense equity. Fine. Now, except for dividend, now that is because the full uh, the intergroup dividend, the intergroup dividend actually depends on the ownership interest um, of the parents in the subsidiary. Okay. So in order you need to find out intergroup dividend, the intergroup dividend. And then eliminate those intergroup dividends may result in adjustment of NCI. So we're going to have a look at this part separately later. Okay. Now the new issue we are dealing with today, that is calculation of NCI in the grant chart company. Because NCI in grant chart company includes both DNCI and INCI. Now we already learned how to calculate DNCI in the previous topic. Now we're going to have a look at the calculation of INCI. All right, now, so you can see the calculation of NCI share of equity in grant child company. Now, our major consideration in performing a consultation with INCI is to distinguish between pre-acquisition equity of the subsidiary and post-acquisition movement of the subsidiary, uh, of the equity of the subsidiary. Okay. Now, this is the three-step methods we learned in the previous session, right? So in the previous topic, we only focused on DNCI. And when calculate the DNCI, uh, we apply all the three steps, which in another word, DNCI receive a share of both pre and post acquisition equity of the subsidiary. Now, however, INCI, we only, INCI here only receive a share of the post acquisition movement of the equity of the subsidiary. Now you may wondering why. Okay, so we are gonna explain the reason why INCI only receive a share of the post-acquisition equity of the subsidiary. Okay. Now we're going to go back to our original group structure. So I'm going to at this group structure, but we would like to explain the reason why only DNCI receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity of the subsidiary, okay? Now, if you look at DNCI in A first, now this party is entitled to receive a share of the net asset of A, right? So this party, DNCI in A, now this party is entitled to a share of the net asset of A. And one of A's asset is its investment in B, which is recorded in A as a shares in B or investment in B, right? When A acquired 60% shares in B, one of A's asset is shares in B or investment in B. Now this asset reflect this equity balance on acquisition date, <coughs> which in another word, this pre-acquisition equity balance is included, right, in A's net asset, showing in A's balance sheet, shares in B. And this mm -hmm. net asset, we allocate 30% to DNCI in A, which in other word, DNCI in A already received a share of B's pre-acquisition equity, right? Now let's continue on. Because INCI in B is the same party of DNCI in A, these two represent the same party, right? It is this party has an indirect non control interest in B. So these two are actually the same party. Now if you give INCI a share of B's pre-acquisition equity balance, what happened? Double counting, right? There's double counting. 
Okay, do we get that? Now let's repeat again. Okay, so first of all, D and C are in A, receive a share of A's net asset, right? And one of the A's asset is investment in B. And this investment in B reflects B's pre-acquisition equity, right? And B's pre-acquisition equity, therefore, received by DNCIA, because DNCIA receives share of A's net asset that includes its investment in B. Okay. Now, if you give I and C in B a share of B's pre-acquisition equity balance, there is double counting, because DNCIA in A is the same party of I and C in B. So to avoid double counting, we only allocate B's post-acquisition equity to I and C. Okay? Now D and C in B receive a share of both the B's pre and the post acquisition equity. However, for I and C, we only allocate B's post acquisition equity movement. Okay. Now this is to avoid the double counting. All right. <coughs> Now, so now we understand the reason, or the rationale behind these rules, right? So why only D and C receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity? So this is to avoid the double counting. Okay? Now, however, for post-acquisition, that movement is not reflected in A's investment in B's account. So post-acquisition equity, we allocate to both D and C I and I and C I. Right now, based on these rules and principles, let's look at the following example. Okay? So you can see D and C I, as we have demonstrated earlier, receive a proportionate share of all equity recorded by subsidiary, including subsidiaries pre and post acquisition amounts, equity balance amounts, right? Mm -hmm. And I and C receive only a proportionate share of subsidiaries post acquisition equity. Okay? Now, in this example, we are assuming this is on acquisition day. So P acquires 70% interest in A, and on the same time, A acquires 60% interest in B. Okay. Now you can see there's a D and C I in A that is 30%. And on the acquisition day, so you can see, um, oh well, at the same time, A acquires 60% interest in B, right? So you can see on that day, one of the A's asset here, you have shares in B. Now assuming A paid 60,000 to acquire 60% shares in B, and all the B's net asset on that day equal to fair value, which in other words, no fair value adjustment is required, okay? Now then you can see the total equity of B on the acquisition day is 100,000. A acquired 60%, so therefore as B acquired by A is 60,000, right? And A paid 60,000. There's no gains, no goodwill. Okay, no gain, no goodwill, all right? Okay. Now, so you can see A's uh, net asset, therefore, including its investment in B, right? So this 60,000 reflect B's pre-acquisition equity balance, which reflect A's share of B's pre-acquisition equity balance, okay? Now then this balance, then we allocate 30% to D and C I in A. Now then if you look at B, so for B limited, we have both D and C, I and C, I. So D and C receive a share of this 40% of 100,000, right? And the uh, parent's share is 42%. So you allocate 42%, so that is to the parent's company. Now, what about I and C? Now, I and C does not receive any share of these pre-acquisition equity because these two represent by the same party. And this party already receive a share of B's pre-acquisition equity balance uh, by its share of A's net asset, okay? All right, now let's look at the following MCQ question. I'll just check up attendance at the same time, okay? Golf phone? Golf phone? Yeah, do you have your answer? Let me know when you're ready, okay? To share yourself. <coughs> Chen Tao, Lin Chen Tao. Liu Jun, do you have your answer? C, 
You agree C? Okay. So a proportionate share of post acquisition equity only that is correct because INC, right? So INC is entitled to receive only the post acquisition equity, right, of the subsidiary. So C is the right answer. Well done. Okay. So let's look at the next one. Chen, Mao Yin Chen. Is Yin Chen here? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the last one, a proportion issue of both pre and post acquisition equity. Well done. So because here is a DNC, right? So DNC receives share of all the equity of the subsidiary that reflect in the consolidated accounts. So including both pre and post. Very good. Okay. So that's why we choose D, the last one. <coughs> All right. Now let's look at the effect of intergroup transaction on the NCI calculation here. Now, first of all, the elimination entry are exactly the same as we have previously discussed. So full elimination is required. So all the intergroup as a lot revenue expense equity must be eliminated in full. So full elimination. Now, regardless of the NCI interest in the subsidiary, and regardless of the existence of INC and the DNCI, right? So full effects. Okay. But you need to pay attention to who made the profit or loss. So which entity is a seller, right? Which entity is a seller? If it is a limited sell item to either P or B, and record the profit and loss in its accounts. And if this profit and loss remains unrealized, your elimination entry prepared in the worksheet effectively affects the equity of A, right? And therefore, you need to adjust NCI in A. Now, if the seller is B limited, the B sell item to A or P, and recognize the profit and loss from the sale, and this profit and loss remains unrealized, from the group viewpoint. Now, when I say unrealized, means this transfer item still within the group, right? Still within the group, okay? Now, if it remains unrealized, then we need to prepare elimination entries. And those elimination entries affect the equity of B limited, right? So equity of B either increase or decrease, resulting in NCI share of B's equity balance should also need, uh, also need to be adjusted accordingly. So, your adjustment then will be based on uh, here 58%. Now remember that these intergroup transactions relate to directly relate to the post acquisition equity. Therefore, both D and C or I and C I receive a share of that. What if the seller is a parent? You again need to prepare elimination entries, but do you need to adjust N C I? Do you need to adjust N C I if the seller is a parent? No, we don't mm. need to adjust N C I, right? So if the elimination entry affects the parent's equity balance, nothing to do with NCI, okay? So always pay attention to who made the profit and loss in the intergroup, on this intergroup transaction. All right, now let's look at the next one. Yes, do you get your answer? Uh, the second one, is there any different opinion? Any different opinion here? Everyone agree, right? Everyone agree. What about Chen Yu? Shi Chen Yu? Uh, you also agree B. Well done. Okay, so B is the correct answer here, right? Full elimination is required. Eliminating full in your consolidation worksheet, all the intergroup as a liability from the expense equity. Okay. Now this is not going to be affected by the existence of NCI. Okay. All right, now, so you can see effect of intergroup transaction on the calculation of NCI, so we have to consider, right, the effect of NCI of such adjustment. Now the key is to determine which entity record the profit on the transaction, whether it is a parent, right, or child company or grandchild company in the group. As we have previously demonstrated, if the parent's company 
earn the profit loss by selling item either to subsidiary A or B. The elimination entry does not affect NC9 because the elimination simply affects the equity of the parent, nothing to do with NCI. So NCI re receive a share of the subsidiary's equity balance that reflected in your consolidated accounts, okay? Now if it's A limited, so we know NCI in A is 70%, right? If A earned a profit loss by selling item to either parents or subsidiary B limited, now again, same elimination entries, full elimination entries required, but you need to prepare NCI adjustment, and your adjustment is based on 30%, that is NCI in A, that is 30%. Okay. Now if it's a subsidiary B limited, the grandchild company in the group earn the profit loss by selling to parent or subsidiary A, then again, full elimination entry. The elimination entry is always the same. Doesn't matter who sell to whom, right? So this is not our concern, as long as the intergroup transaction. So full elimination is required. But in addition to that, we need to adjust NCI in B. Now NCI in B includes both D and CI and CI. But you don't need to adjust that separately, okay? So we adjust the total NCI in B, which is 58%. So your adjustment is based on the 58%. There's no need to recall D and CI separate from I and CI. So we use the same NCI accounts, and that includes both DNCI interest and INCI interest. Any question, let me know. Okay. All right, now let's use a following example to test your understanding. Okay. So I will make some variation of this example as well. <clears throat> let's have the original version. In the current year, B Limited, who is the B Limited? The grandchild company in the group, right? The B Limited sold inventory parent for 25 sales, that is intergroup sales. At a profit before tax, 5,000. Now the inventory is still on hand, which means all these 5,000 remains unrealized, okay? At the end of the current year. Now we first of all have to prepare the consolidation worksheet entry to eliminate these unrealized profit, that is, recorded by B limited, right, in our worksheet. Now apply the four step methods we learned in the previous session. Step one, eliminate all the intergroup sales revenue in full, right, full elimination, based on the information provided here in the question 25,000 debit sales. Step two, adjust the carrying amount of the inventory. And the inventory carrying adjustment is based on the amount of unrealized profit contained in closing balance inventory. So how do you find out the unrealized profit? Now we know the total profit from the on the intergroups are 5,000. Because all the inventory is still on hand, which means all these 5,000 remains unrealized. So we're simply using 5,000 multiplied by 100%, right? So the unrealized profit contained in closing balance of inventory, that is 5,000. Now step three, the balancing figure. Let's adjust cost of sale, okay? So you can see debit sales, credit cost of sale, the unrealized profit, 5,000, now is eliminated. No profit, no tax, right? So profit reduced, therefore, income tax expense of the group should also decrease. So 5,000 multiplied by 30% tax rate, the income tax reduced by 1,500. And on the debit side, we recognize DTA. Now why DTA? You look at this adjustment, credit inventory. Now, when inventory were acquired by parents, P limited, right? What is, a, what is a tax base of this inventory for this legal entity, P limited? 25,000. Uh, and the carrying amount of cost before adjustment is also 25,000. There's no temporary differences. But these 25,000 from the group viewpoint is overstated. And that's why in your worksheet, you need to reduce the carrying amount by 5,000. Now, this create temporary differences. Because caramel after the adjustment is lower than tax base, the difference is deductible temporary differences. And that deductible temporary differences leads to the recognition of the deferred tax asset. Now this is one way of explaining this, right? The alternative way, B limited record profit on the intergroup sale. And that is 5,000 profit included in B's record. Now B is a separate legal entity, right? Pay 
its own tax, which in other words, B will pay the tax for this profit in the year of the transaction. However, from the group viewpoint, because this profit remains unrealized, should there any payment of this tax? No, right? However, B already will pay the tax. Therefore, the tax paid by B in relation to this profit, that is a prepaid tax, which from group viewpoint, that is the group future tax benefits. That's why we recognize BPA. Okay. So once you get your understanding, you won't mess up the DTA, DTL when you prepare your worksheet entries here. All right, now then move on to the next, NCI adjustment. So you can see the unrest profit before tax is 5,000, after tax, 3,500, right? So this is the profit in the record of B limited. Therefore, the elimination entries we prepared here effectively reduce B's after tax profit by 3,500 that B limited contribute to the group. Therefore, NCI in B must be adjusted accordingly, right? So what is the NCI in B? 58%. Therefore, 58% multiply the after-tax profit, 3,500. Now this is our adjustment in the worksheet. So you debit NCI, NCI decrease. Why decrease? Because NCI share of the consolidated profit decrease. And this profit is contributed by B limited to the group. <coughs> All right, any question from here? Okay, now let's make another version, okay? So assuming the seller is parent, P limited, P sell this to B, everything else still same. Any change of this part? No, same, right? What about NCI adjustment? What about NCI adjustment? What about NCI adjustment? Is there any NCI adjustment? No NCI adjustment, right? So NCI adjustment zero, no need to adjust NCI because the seller, I change the seller to parents. And these entries then only affect the equity of the parent, nothing to do with NCI, okay? Now let's make another version. What if the seller is A limited? A sells this inventory, sold this inventory P. The seller is A limited now. Any change of this part? No, no still same, right? What about NCI? What about NCI? Do you need to adjust NCI in A? Yes, and the NCI in A is 30%. So your adjustment is based on 30% of 3,500. Okay, so we debit and say credit and say share profit, but the number, you need to change that. Okay, so based on NCA in A, that is 30% of 3,500. Okay, so always pay attention to who is a seller in this integral transaction. Any question from this part? Let me know. All right, now let's move on to look at dividend. Now this one is interesting, okay. So what happened to dividend? First of all, no dividend is paid directly to I and CI. Here we are assuming the grandchild company declare and pay dividend, okay. Now, what is the problem when grandchild company paid out dividend? Now let's give an example. Now, first of all, let's assume, sorry. So first of all, let's assume B limited earn a profit this year, 1,000, okay? After tax, okay. Now, when B made a profit, I and say in B receive share of that, right? Because it's a post acquisition equity of B. So now we give I and say I, right? In B, we call it each share of the profit that is one thousand times eighteen percent, which is one eight. Okay. Then B pay. 
pay all these profit as a dividend. Now, when B paid all these 1,000 as a dividend, A owns 60% shares in B, which means A record a dividend round, right? This is paid by B, right? That is equal to 1,000 times 60%, which is 600. Okay? Now, this 600 is included in A's carrier profit. Now, let's assume A don't have other profit. Now, the A's profit, D and C in A receive share of that, right? So let's say D and C I in A share, right? Uh, receive, D and C in A receive share of A's profit, which is equal to 600 times 30%. That is 180. Oh, what is the problem here? <laughs> let's double. Because D and C I, I and C I in B, D and C I in A. This is the same party, right? It is the same party. Okay. And uh, this is all comes from the profit from earned by B, right? So B make a profit, then we distribute that. Uh, uh, I and C in B receive share of that. We call it 150. Uh, sorry, 180. Then B paid out this profit as a dividend, A recognized dividend revenue, and then NCI in A receive share of that is another 180, but these two are the same part. There is a double counting. Okay. Now, how we are going to resolve this issue, how to avoid the double counting? Very simple. We just eliminate the intra group dividend revenue, right? So look at the dividend revenue we call by A. That is revenue first and then adjust NCI in A because the integral dividend is recorded by A limited. <coughs> Make sense? Okay. So take a couple minutes to think about that. Okay. So starting with the profit earned by B and giving the share to its I and CI. Okay. And then B paid dividend to its shareholders. So the majority of shares hold by A, right? So A recognizes 600 as a dividend round. However, from the group viewpoint, it is an intro group dividend round. Okay. And this intro group dividend round is required to be eliminated. Right. So when you eliminate the intro group dividend round, then you need to adjust NCI. <laughs> and you can see once you make these adjustments, we no longer have any double counting problems. Simply just I and CI in B receive a share of this profit. That's it, right? Because all these were eliminated. Okay. Now let me know if there's any question at this stage. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So I didn't get the question. W why is full elimination? Full elimination. Full, full elimination. I mean, One, two, three, four, four. No, I mean, after, uh, 
full elimination. Now, there, it is a full elimination because introvable dividends actually depends on the parent's ownership interest, right? So A owns 60% shares in B. Therefore, only 60% of dividend paid by B is recognized by A as a dividend value. And it is this 600 dividend is integral dividend. And you have to eliminate in full. They all be eliminated in full. Now the remaining 40% of dividend paid by B, we have another NCL entry. So that is the NCI in B. Okay? So there will be a debit of NCI and a credit of dividend paid. That is another Only these 600 represent introvert dividend. This 400 is not introvert dividend, right? In the case of NCI, NCI is not the member in the group. The group only can have the parent and uh, the control of two dividends. Okay, so it is a full elimination of the dividend, but it's an introvert dividend only. Okay, not all the dividend. I'm not sure if that answer your question. <laughs> uh. Uh, so, um, uh, what, what mean by full elimination? Do you the full elimination means all the intergroup asset, liability, mm -hmm. revenue, expense, equity must be eliminated in the worksheet because in your consolidated statements, we should only show the transaction events dealing with a party outside of the group. So that's the reason why you need to prepare this elimination entry to remove the effect of this intergroup transaction in your consolidation worksheet. And the full elimination of intergroup dividend well, depends on the ownership interest right, in the subsidiary. Here the ownership interest is only 60%, then you only need to eliminate the intergroup dividend of 600. The other 400 dividend you pay to NCI, NCI is not the group, part of the group. <coughs> Well, that is, depends on the ownership interest in the subsidiary here. So here, interest is 60%, then you multiply 60%. If 80%, multiply 80% to find out the intergroup dividend round. And it is this intergroup dividend round need to be eliminated in the worksheet. Okay, no worries. Now, let's look at the example here. Dividend paid by Grant Child Company B limited. Now B paid 2,000 dividend, right? 60% of that recognized and received by A as a dividend revenue. And that is the intergroup dividend revenue again, right? So 60% multiplied by 2,000. So there is an intergroup dividend revenue in the record of A limited that is 1,200. For consolidation purpose, this intergroup dividend income must be eliminated in the worksheet. So that's why your debit dividend revenue, 1,200 credit dividend paid. Now the other 40% of 2,000 dividend you paid to B and CI, right? So we have a separate entry to record that is debit NCI credit dividend paid. So this is based on 40% of 2,000 dividend paid to the DNCI party, okay? Now the elimination of this dividend revenue here, you can see, reduce A's current year profit by 1,200. When A's profit decrease, NCI in A should also decrease, right? Now that's the reason why you have this new entry, additional NCI adjustment. So this is adjustment of NCI in A, right? So NCI in A reduced by 1,200 multiply 30%, which is 360. So your debit NCI in A reduced, why is that? Because NCI share of A's current year profit decrease. So this second entry is to 
avoid the double counting, right? It's to avoid the double counting. <coughs> now let me know if there's any question here. So this is adjust for the NCI in B, right? DNCI in B who received the dividend. And this adjustment for NCI in A because of this elimination of integral dividend revenue in the record of A limited. Now this elimination entry result in additional NCI adjustment. Mm. Mm. Well, it's really up to you, right? As long as you can get the right answer, it doesn't matter how you're going to memorize that. Yeah. But it's good to establish the underlying logic. So understand the reason why you need to do that, you won't forget. So for example here, why I have to prepare this? Because that is the integral of dividend revenue, right? Based on our underlying principles, the integral of dividend revenue need to be eliminated. And then you ask yourself, how this is going to affect NCI? Well, this dividend revenue is recorded by A. A's profit decrease means NCI in A need to be reduced. Okay, so if you can establish this logic understanding, then it might be easy, okay, to work on a similar question. Yeah. Okay, all right. Now let's move on to look at dividend declared. Now it's common company may declare dividend uh, towards the end of reporting date and then paid in the following financial year. Now this will result in a dividend payable to be recognized by subsidiary B limited, right? And A corresponds to record a dividend receivable. Now again, this is the integral dividend payable, receivable, right? This is the integral asset, asset liability. Now this must be eliminated. Now, in addition to that, we don't forget to eliminate the integral dividend revenue against dividend declared. Now, make sure you use appropriate accounts, okay? So this is declared not paid. <coughs> now, in addition to that, you can see the elimination of integral dividend revenue resulting adjustment for the NCI in A because this is a dividend revenue recognized by A limited, right? And once it's eliminated, A's profit in the current year would decrease. And A's profit decrease, NCI share of A's current year profit also decrease. So you have a debit NCI, credit NCI share of profit. Yeah. Now for the remaining 40% of dividend declared by B, well, will be received by its NCI. Okay. Now because when B paid out dividend, it's equity reduced, therefore NCI share of B's equity also decrease. But in compensate, this party re will receive uh, 1,200 cash dividend later. Okay. So it's more like a return of their investments. <coughs> of course, declare, say, I'm going to distribute dividend. Okay, but you will receive that later. When I declare it, I raise a payable, right? You recall the receivable if you are the shareholders. Paid means you get the cash at the point where you recall the transaction. And I'm recording the transaction at the point where the cash dividend is paid. So usually declare and, uh, and pay uh, in the same years related to the intra dividend. For final dividend, that is declared and will be paid in the following financial year. <coughs> and when you have a dividend declared, uh, you need to raise payable, right? And the other side, the other party record receivable. Now when it is paid declared in the same accounting period, then there's no need to raise a payable receivable because the entries will be passed at the point when the cash dividend is paid and when the cash dividend is received by the shareholders. Now NCA is like equity. NCA is equity, okay? So these equity account increase when subsidiaries equity increase. And the NCI balance decrease when subsidiaries equity reduce. Because NCI receive a share of the subsidiaries equity that is reflected in the consolidated accounts. When subsidiaries equity reduce, NCI share of the subsidiary equity should also reduce, vice versa. 
as an equity, reduce you record on the debit. Okay, so you cannot mess up the debit credit rules. That is very very important. Okay, that is the fundamental things. All right. <clears throat> okay, let's take a short break. Right. So let's take a uh, ten minutes break and then coming back. Now we are going to look at these comprehensive income. Now these example incorporate all the consolidation uh, rules, principles, and uh, entries that we have learned so far. Okay? So quite comprehensive. So we plan to do that after the break time. Okay? Let's take a 10 minutes break from now. Mm.
be ready to, well, if I do the pathway method example. Now, in this example, we are going to look at the group structure where parent company, the P limited, sorry about that, acquired 70% interest in us limited on 1st July 21. Now, this is our acquisition day, okay? Now, uh, P limited paid for 70,000 in this acquisition. On the same day, so you can see this is a sequential acquisition, right? On the same day, us limited acquired 60% interest in T limited for 35,000. When acquired the equity of, uh, when, when the equity of the T includes a share capital of 35,000, return earnings of 15,000. Now this is us and T's pre-acquisition uh, return earnings share capital balance. Now then moving on to the next slide, so you will find um, the equity balance of S and T on acquisition day. This is acquisition day, right? Beginning of the current year. And the current year end balance. Now current financial year is ended on 30 June 23. You are going to prepare the worksheet entries on that day as well. Right? So you have acquisition day balance, beginning of current year, and the current year ending balance. Now, other information you need to pay attention to is the acquisition day there is an asset held by S Limited. Now, that's inventory here, right? Recorded at 10,000 below fair value. So, caramel is 10,000 below fair value. So, we need fair value adjustment of this item when conducting your acquisition analysis. Do we need RSC entries on 30 June 23? Do you need to prepare any RSA entry for this item on 30 June 23? Yes or no? Do we need to prepare RSA entry? Zizhou? Song, Song Zizhou. Do, do we need to prepare RSA entry of this inventory on 30 June 23 worksheet? Yes or no on question? Yeah, 23, do we need to prepare RSC entry of the inventory on 30 June 23 consultation worksheet? Yes or no? <laughs> Not quite sure, right? So what happened, this already sold last year, which means this asset, that's right, no, right? So it's already sold by end of last year, which means this asset's no longer in the record of us. When it is not in the record of us, we don't need to prepare any RC entry, right? Nothing need to be revalued, it's gone, right? It's sold. Right? So we don't need to prepare any RC entry of the inventory in your worksheet on 30 June 23. Okay, that's a good start. Now let's move on to look at the next point. Now T had a plant which was recorded 5,000 below fair value. 5,000 below fair value. So again, you have to consider the fair value adjustment, right? When conducting the acquisition of S in T, okay? Now, do we need to prepare ISA entry for the plant in your worksheet on 30 June 23? Zhong Yao, Zhong Yao, Zhi Zhong Yao, Zhong Yao. Yes, what is it? Do, you, do we need to prepare ISA entry for the plant on 30 June 23? The plant is still in the record of the subsidiary T Limited. So do we need to revalue that? We should, right? We should continue to revalue this item because this plant is still used by T Limited. The plant has remaining five years since the acquisition and now it's two years since the acquisition. So considering the plant is still in the recall of T-Limit, we should continue recall the revaluation entry for this item in your worksheet, right? And because plant is a depreciable item, do not forget depreciation adjustment, right? Now moving on to the next, during the year ended 30 June 23, as report after tax profit of 18,000 paid 8,000 dividend. Now this information is important when we calculate step three NCI, right? This is related to step three NCI calculation. 
Now then moving on to uh, the next part, subsidiary T limited also report the profit. Uh, this is the after tax cost of 30,000 paid dividend 25,000. Now also relate to step three, NCI. And this dividend will, will create integral dividend, right? So this dividend payment will result in our entity in the group to recognize intergroup dividends. So we have to pay attention for the elimination of this intergroup dividend in the worksheet. Now finally, now this is related to current year intergroup transferred inventory. Who is a seller here? A T limited, which in other words, the unrest profit is contained in T's record, right? And this transaction took place in the current year. So the elimination entry therefore will effectively reduce T's current year profit that T contribute to the group. And you need to remind yourself to adjust NCI in T. Now, when analyzing all these information we have, let's start our consolidation process. Step one, conduct acquisition analysis. Now you have a two acquisitions, then you should conduct two acquisition analysis. Right. So you may ask which goodwill method I should apply here, full goodwill method or partial goodwill method. Can you apply full goodwill method based on the available information? You can't. Why? There's no NCI fair value, right? So fair value of NCI is not given. You can't apply for good message. So the question actually implies the adoption of partial good message, okay? All right, now let's use partial good message to conduct acquisition analysis. You only need to find out the goodwill acquired by the parent. To find the goodwill acquired by the parents, we compare consideration with Athena acquired. The consideration is given, right? Okay. Now, Athena acquired, we need to calculate Athena of as limited first. So as pre-acquisition share capital balance retained earnings, now these together equal to the book value of subsidiary as limited net asset on the acquisition date. Now, they're also the identifiable net asset that is the base assumption. All the subsidiaries record as a liability, they are identifiable items. Do we need a fair value adjustment? Yes, because the inventory in the recall of subsidiary on acquisition day is 10,000 below the fair value. So we need fair value adjustment for the inventory. Adjustment should always be after tax, right? Net of the tax. Therefore, 10,000 multiply 70%, so your fair value adjustment of the inventory is 7,000. Book value of the identifiable net asset plus fair value adjustment net of tax, then you get Athena. This is the fair value of the identifiable net asset. Athena acquired, we multiply 70%. Okay. So you can see Athena acquired 70,000 is equal to consideration paid. There is no goodwill or gains on market purchase. Now then move on to look at the second acquisition. The following is the same step. We start with concentration transfer, and that is a given. And then we calculate Athena. Now, Athena is equal to the book value of T's net asset reference to the equity balance of T on acquisition date. Right. Now then we plus fair value adjustment. So there's item plot, right, require fair value adjustment. Now the plot is recorded in T's book as 5,000 below fair value. So 5,000 multiplied by 70%, you will get 3,500. Now this is an after-tax fair value adjustment. Mm -hmm. okay. So 50,000 plus 3,500, you will get Athena 53,500. Now Athena acquired in this acquisition is 60%. Right? So 60% of this amount, you will get 32,100. Right. Now compare that with consideration transfer. Uh, consideration is greater than the Athena acquired. The difference represents the goodwill on acquisition. So we find goodwill in our second acquisition, and you need to recognize this goodwill in pre-acquisition entry. Now, this is our first step. So any question from the acquisition analysis? Let me know, okay, if you have any question. So, yes. Mm. 
we don't need to prepare RNC entry for the inventory because it is already sold in the prior year. And then the balance you initially record in RSC, right? Now this balance now is transferred to retain earnings. So effectively your pre-acquisition retain earnings would increase by 7,000 and your pre-acquisition RSC balance now is zero. Okay, so because we are preparing the worksheet entries on 30 June 23 and the transfer is made in the prior year. Very good question, anything else? Okay. Now let's move on to look at our RSC entries. As all the inventory were sold by end of the last year, on 30, uh, ended on 30 June 22, right? So we do not need to record any RSC entries. But the revaluation gains, which is previously recording RSC balance, now is transferred to the pre-acquisition rating earnings. So the pre-acquisition returnings of us limited now is 40,000 rather than 33,000. So the transfer is made in the prior year worksheet. Now in addition to that, we got a plump, right? In the record of T limited, and record by T as 5,000 below is fair value. So the plant has remained used for like five years and therefore still in the record of the subsidiary and uh, we need to continue our RSC entries in the worksheet on 30 June 23. Okay. So prepare RSC entries to revalue the plant to its fair value. In addition to that, don't forget depreciation adjustment. Okay. Now let's prepare RSC entry. Oh, where is debit accumulate depreciation? Now sorry about that. This information is not available in the question, so we can ignore that line, okay? So simply debit plan to adjust the plan from its caramel to fair value, 5,000, and then we credit DTL, right? Because this adjustment increase the carrying amount, but tax base still same, right? So this creates taxable temporary differences and results in the recognition of DTL. Okay. The net of tax revaluation gain is accrued to us, to accrued to revaluation surplus on consolidation accounts after tax. Now in addition to that, don't forget depreciation. Now the total difference between fair value carry amount is 5,000, right? Now this 5,000 will be adjusted over five years through depreciation, okay? So each year depreciation expense need to be debited by 1,000 in the worksheet. Now why debit? Because the subsidiary's recorded depreciation is understated compared to the group. So the group report the depreciation based on the fair value of that asset divided by remaining use for life. Right? However, subsidiary's calculation is based on its carrying amount divided by remaining use for life, which is lower, right, compared to the group. Now, currently depreciation adjustment, 1,000. But this is already two years since the acquisition. You need to carry over the effect from the prior year worksheet adjustment. The prior year, you have 1,000 depreciation adjustment, right? and the prior expense already close to retained earnings. So the debit of retained earnings, this is to carry forward the effect of the prior year worksheet for the depreciation adjustment. Right? And your cumulative depreciation adjustment therefore should reflect two years of the adjustment since the acquisition date. This is already end of year two, right? Now in addition to that, don't forget tax effect entry. Now because the debit of depreciation expense, this will increase the group expense. Therefore, decrease the group profit and decrease the income tax expense of the group. So that 30% uh, of 1,000, so ITE credit by 300. But you also need to carry over prior year IT adjustment to the current year, right? And prior year IT adjustment already close to opening written earnings. Right? So we credit written earnings, 300 needs to carry over the effect of prior year ITE. Now then we're going to show reverse of the DTL. So you can see the DTL balance you raised here from the revaluation entries will be reversed progressively over the remaining useful life through depreciation adjustment, right? So 30% of 2,000, you got 600. Oh, you just total this, get 600. So each year reverse 300, right? Two years, 600. Now you'd better highlight these two lines Return earnings and use a different color to highlight depreciation and ITE. 
Why? Who used this item? T, right? Which, in other words, these adjustments effectively affect the equity and the profit that T limited contribute to the group. So this depreciation IT adjustment here effectively reduce T's after tax profit by 700, right? And the adjustment of debit retained earnings 1,000, credit retained earnings 300, well, again, reduce T's opening retained earnings by 700. Right. So this adjustment directly relate to T's current year profit and T limited opening retained earnings. So you have to consider to incorporate these adjustments in the step two and the step three NCI calculation. Uh, we'll come back to this later when going through the NCI entries. All right, now so after here, we've done RSC entries, right? We've done RSC entries. Right. Now let's move on to look at pre-acquisition entries. To identify pre-acquisition entries, we need to know the subsidiaries, acquisition date equity balance, right? Now this is a given, right? But be careful with us. As pre-acquisition retained earnings no longer 33,000, it has been changed to 40,000 because 7,000 is transferred from RSC balance to pre-acquisition region earnings. It's the inventory held by us were all sold by end of last year. Now for T still same, right? So if you look at our pre-acquisition entries to eliminate T's investment in us. So start with a credit investment in us. This is, this is based on the cost of acquisition. P paid, right, to acquire 70% interest in us. Okay. Then we are going to, again, piece share or piece portion of as pre-acquisition share capital rating earnings. So as acquisition date, share capital balance still, uh, it's a 60,000, doesn't change. And as pre-acquisition earnings now has been increased to 40,000 due to the transfer made from RSC balance to pre-acquisition retained earnings of as limited. Now, 40,000 times 70%, that is P limited share, right? Need to be eliminated to avoid double counting. Still pre-acquisition entries for the second acquisition, right? We are going to eliminate as investment in T. Now, as paid 35,000 to acquire 60% interest in T, right? And as the share of T's pre-acquisition share capital, uh, that is calculated based on 60%. Okay. Now, included is a share of the RSC balance because we prepare the revaluation entry in the worksheet for the plant that is held by T, right? Now, this RSC balance um, is part of T's pre-acquisition equity balance. And then we need to eliminate what is as portion of T's pre-acquisition equity in the uh, pre-acquisition elimination entries. Right. Now don't forget to recognize the goodwill acquired in the acquisition. Now, so this is all about your pre-acquisition entry. You can see exactly the same as we did in the previous session. Right. So it doesn't matter you have two acquisition or three acquisition, we're just following the same process, right. applying the same rules and principles. All right, now let's move on to the NCI entries. Now start with step one, right? What is step one? We need to allocate subsidiaries pre-acquisition equity proportionally to NCI. Now as pre-acquisition equity includes share capital and return earnings, where is RSC? Now RSC balance has already been transferred to the pre-acquisition rating earnings. We don't need RC, okay, for as limited. So then we simply multiply 30% because as in uh, NCI in us is 30% and only DNCI, okay. Now you can always verify this number. Now how to verify that? On the acquisition day, NCI is equal to its proportion share of subsidiaries Athena. So what is as Athena on acquisition day? 100,000, right? So 100,000 times 30%, you get 30,000. 
So still step one, let's look at NCI in T. Now remember that only DNCI receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity of the subsidy. The reason we have used example to explain that early, that is to avoid double counting, right? Now DNCI interest in T is 40%. Right? So 40% of T's pre-acquisition share capital, retained earnings, RC balance, we multiply by 40%, that's it, okay? Now then we credit NCI. So you can say credit is actually equal to the total debit equity allocation to NCI, right? And again, verify this number. How to do that? At V of T on acquisition that you can go back to check your acquisition analysis, okay? Which is 53,500. NCI interest, 40%. So 40% of 53,500, you will get 21,400. So try to verify this number properly based on the available information we already have in our acquisition analysis. Now step one is pretty simple, straightforward, right? Now let's move on to look at step two. Now for step two, we are looking for the equity movement in the subsidiary from acquisition day, this is acquisition day, right? To the beginning of the current year. The beginning of current year is 30 June 22. So let's find out if there's any changes in the equity balance of the subsidiary during the post-acquisition period. So share capital same, don't need to worry about that. Retained earnings, oh, there's an increase. But are we going to compare 33,000 with 45,000? Uh, no, we compare 40,000 with 45,000. Why? Because there are 7,000 transfer from RSC to pre-acquisition returnings of RC Limited. Okay. Now for T Limited, oh, there's an increase in general reserve and there's also an increase in retained earnings. Okay. Now let's start with S Limited. Okay. So you can see the recorded opening, uh, this is the closing of the last year, which is opening of the current year. Okay. Don't get confused. Okay. Now the recorded balance of retained earnings in subsidiary on 30 June 22, that is 45,000. We compare that with the pre-acquisition balance. And the pre-acquisition balance now is 40,000 because the sale of the inventory in the prior year resulting in a transfer that is made from pre-acquisition RSC balance to the pre-acquisition retained earnings balance. Okay. Now let's compare 40,000 with the beginning balance of the current 45,000. There is a positive change of 5,000. Okay. And then we just need to allocate these 5,000 proportionally to NCI. That's done. Right. Now because the number here is positive, your NCI increase, right? Your credit NCI and the debit retained earnings. If the number here is negative, then switch the debit credit sign. Your debit NCI, credit NCI, uh, sorry, credit retained earnings. Okay. So just be very careful whether your adjustment of the retainer, sorry, adjustment of the NCI is on the credit or on the debit. So it depends on, right? So if NCI increase, well, as an equity, NCI should increase in credit. If NCI decrease, you debit. Now let's move on to look at T. Now this is a bit more challenge, right? because for T, it's opening return earnings of the current year, which is the closing balance of last year, right? Now this is given as 18,000. Pre-acquisition return earnings is given as 15,000. So there is a 3,000 positive changes here, right, since the acquisition date. But we need to make adjustment of these 3,000. Where this adjustment comes from? From your RSC entry. Right. Go back to our RSC entries, so you will find there is a debit return earnings 1,000, credit return earnings 300. So the net impact of these two line adjustment is to reduce opening return earnings of T limited Right, reduce T's opening return earnings by 700. Why T? Because this asset is in the record of T, right? This asset is used by T limited. It is T limited recorded depreciation that is understated compared to the book. Therefore, this adjustment effectively reduces the equity that T contribute to the book. So we should take these adjustments into consideration well, before we allocate T's post-acquisition equity movement to NCI, okay? 
Now let's go back to the calculation. So now we understand where to find the seven hundred adjustment. Then you will get adjusted opening post acquisition retained earnings, allocate to both DNC and INC. So each adjustment just based on fifty eight percent. So there's no need to separate record DNC or INC. Okay, you just record in the same NC accounts. Therefore, your adjustment is based on the total NCI in T. That is fifty eight percent. So 58% time 2,300, you got 1,334. The debit retail earnings credit and CI. In addition to that, we find the changes in general reserve, right? The general reserve increased by 5,000, therefore NCI receive a share of that. So you have debit general reserve credit and CI. So the total of NCI on the credit adjustment, that'll be 4,234. Now let me know if there's any question here, okay? So both DNCI, INCI receive a share of the post acquisition equity of the subsidiary. Okay. So the key is to find the changes in the equity balance subsidiary from the acquisition date to the beginning of the current year. If you have any RC entry related to that, to any asset in the recall of that subsidiary then don't forget to take these adjustments into your accounts. Right. All right, moving on to the final step, right? This is our final step. We are going to look at what happened in the current year, right? That affects the equity balance of S and T. Now, start with S. Now, S report after tax profit of 18,000, pay 8,000 dividend. Now we're going to look at dividend as part of a stage two entry because this calls into to dividend, right? So we're going to look at in the stage two entry. Okay? So focus on the profit first. Now when we'll estimate the profit, NCI receives share of that. And we don't need to make any further adjustment for the as recorded profit. Right? There's no fair value adjustment directly related to any asset liability in the recall of us. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we simply just allocate 30 percent to NCI in S uh, by debit, NCI share profit, credit, NCI. Okay. So NCI increase because NCI receive share of S profit that S contribute to the group. Okay. Now, then move on to look at T. Now T limited also report the profit, and that is uh, thirty thousand and paid twenty five thousand dividend. So once again, the dividend part we look at together. Uh, with intergroup transaction, with intergroup transaction later. Okay. Now T's reported profit need to be adjusted before the allocation. Why is that? Uh, RSC entry, right? Don't forget RSC entry. You prepare early. Now your RSC entry include adjustment of depreciation and ITE. Now this is for the plant, right? In the record of T. Effectively, these two line adjustment reduce T's current year profit by 700. So T's current year profit, after tax profit, reduced by 700 because the depreciation ITE adjustment we prepared in the worksheet. And we should, of course, take these adjustment into your accounts, right? Then we find out the adjusted after tax profit of so using 30,000 is reported profit minus the 700 adjustment. Now the adjusted after tax profit of T, we allocate 58% to NCI. Okay. So simply debit NCI share profit, credit NCI. Now up to here, we have successfully, right, complete three step NCI calculation. And this is also your stage one NCI measurement. Okay. Now move on to stage two. You need to identify all the intergroup transaction occurred in the current year. And uh, pay attention to who recall the profit loss on this intergroup transaction. Okay. This is a current year transaction, right? This is a current year transaction. In the current period, T sell the inventory 
to uh, to whom doesn't matter, right? It's like the intro group, but to tell uh, sell to whom? Uh, to P, okay, to parents, right? But this is not going to change our answer. So as long as it's an integral transaction. Now the important information here is it is included in T's book. There is an unrealized profit resulting from this integral transaction. Now the unrealized profit is 10,000 before tax, okay? So I will make it very clear in the exam question whether it is before tax profit, okay? We don't need to make any assumption. <coughs> now, so this profit is before tax. It's remain unrealized and therefore need to be eliminated. Right. Now because the integral sales round is given, right? The original cost will be 15,000 because profit is equal to integral selling price minus the original cost. Okay. Now we already know the total unrealized profit of 10,000. Okay. Uh, we debit sales to eliminate all the integral sales revenue. Uh, we create an inventory to adjust the camera inventory. And this adjustment is based on the amount of unrealized profit contained in closing balance of the inventory. Now balancing figure, we adjust cost of sale. So you can see these three line adjustment you place in the worksheet, reduce the group profit by 10,000. Now why we have to eliminate that? Because they are remain unrealized from the group perspective. No profit, no tax. Now when we reduce group profit by 10,000, the income tax expense of the group should also decrease. 10,000 multiply 30% tax rate, the ITE reduced by 3,000. And on the debit side, you are going to recognize DTA. I explained that early, right? Why DTA? Because the legal entity will pay the tax for this profit earned. Well, from the group viewpoint, this is the future tax benefits, right? It's a prepaid tax. Represent the group tax benefits in the future. Now, so you can see the after tax profit of the group reduced by 7,000, right? And this profit is contributed by T limited. Therefore, NCI share of T's current profit should also decrease. So you have a stage two additional NCI adjustment in your stage two. So with debit NCI, NCI decrease. Why decrease? Because NCI share of the consolidated profit reduce. And this profit is contributed by T limited. Now what about next year? Let's make this question a bit more challenge. What about next year? 30 June 24. Think about that. 30 June 24. What is your consult? Now by 30 June 24, we can assume you need to inventory or all sold. That is reasonable assumption, right? Because inventory is a current asset. So over the inventory, will expect to be sold by end of the following year. So if you're preparing the worksheet entry on 30 June 24, what's your answer? <coughs> we start with the elimination entry. Can anyone tell me what is my, what's my elimination entry? Now I have a intergroup transfer. Now I'm at 30 June 24, right? Which means I have an intergroup transfer inventory in the last year. And by the end of last year, this inventory remains unsold. Therefore, I have unrealized profit contained in open inventory. So your first line adjustment is debit. So you can earn it, right? Open inventory. which contains in Albany return earnings. So we can use sales 25,000 minus cost of sale 15,000, that is 10,000, right? Minus income tax expense 3,000. Now your Albany return earnings contain this unrealized profit resulting from prior year integral transfer inventory. What else? None of these inventory sold in the current year. 
far less cost of sale. The credit cost of sale or cost of goods sold, that is 10,000, right? And because cost of sale increase, profit increase, therefore increase income tax. And now from here, you might agree with that, or oh, this we have unrest profit contained in opening rated earnings. <coughs> And because this inventory is sold to the outside party in the current year, then now this unrest profit in the opening return earnings now is realized, right? So you can see these two line adjustment debit ICE credit cost of sale increase the current year after tax profit of the group by 7,000. So unrest profit at the beginning remain unrealized, contained in opening return earnings. Now it's realized in the current year by adjustment for the current year cost of sale and IT. Now how this is going to affect your NCI in Q on 32.24? What about your NCI adjustment after this? The NCI debit or credit? Reducing opening return earnings means reduce NCI share of return earnings. That will be a debit, right? NCI. <coughs> 7,000 times 58% for all. <coughs> and that credit rating earnings, that is turn on entry one. Anything else? Oh, you can look at these two lines. This resulting profit increase, right? Therefore, NCI increase. And this is due to the NCI share of profit increase. This two line even now, right? Debit NCI, credit NCI, sorry, is the same amount, right? This even now. So when you combine these two entries, your final answer will be debit NCI share of profit, credit rating earnings. That's all. Does it make sense? So make sure you understand how to prepare the integral animation. Actually, this part is the key. If this part is wrong, then you won't be able to find appropriate NC adjustment. So that's what I said. Integral animation entries will not be required separately in the final exam, but topic five and six, yes, right? And in order to get these adjustments, you need to understand how to identify the integral elimination entry correctly. And then you'll be able to determine your NCI adjustment. All right, okay. <laughs> now, so it's just a bit extension of this question. So it's for year 23, right? And this for year 24. <coughs> All right, now then move on to look at dividend. Now both of these two entities pay dividend. Now start with S Limited. Now S paid 8,000 dividend. Then 70% of these received by parents company, P Limited. Now P recognize dividend revenue, which from group viewpoint that is intra-group dividend revenue. So the elimination of the intra-group dividend revenue is required in the worksheet. So using 8,000 multiplied by P's interest in us, that is 70%. So with debit dividend revenue, credit dividend paid. Now there's no payable receipt because the payment of the dividend already made. Okay. Anything else after this admission of dividend revenue? No, because the dividend is in the record of P. The parents' company, we call this dividend revenue, and after this image entry, 
parents, you, parents and the discount your profit reduce. Nothing to do with NCI, right? It simply just reduce the group profit, that's it. Yeah. Now the remaining 30% of dividend paid by us to is DNCI, right? So we debit NCI credit dividend paid for 2,400, that's all. Now this is for the dividend paid by us limited to its parent, P limited, and to its NCI party. So only the dividend recognized by parent company is considered as an intra-group dividend revenue and it is required to be eliminated for consolidation purpose. Now things are a bit more complicated when T as a grandchild company paid dividend. Now you can see T paid a total dividend of 25,000. Because us owns 60% shares in T. Therefore us would recognize 15,000 dividend revenue in its accounts. And because the payment of dividend is from us to T and there are the party in the same group, right? So therefore, the dividend revenue recognized by us limited is intra-group, is an intra-group dividend revenue, which is required to be eliminated for consolidation purpose. So simply debit dividend revenue, intra-group dividend revenue, right? 15,000 credit dividend paid. Now, because this debit dividend revenue effectively reduce the profit as contribute to the group in the current year. Now, when us current year profit decrease, NCI share of us profit should also decrease. So you have additional adjustment is to show NCI share of us current year profit decrease. So this is based on 15,000, the elimination of the dividend revenue recalled by us, reduce us profit by 15,000, right? And NCI in S is 30%. So 15,000 multiplied by 30%, NCI share of S current year profit should reduce by 4,500. So let me know if there's any question. Okay. And for the 40% of dividend paid by T to its DNCI, uh, we simply debit NCI, credit dividend pay. Now, that is all our NCI entries in stage two. No, 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 this 30% is NCI in S because P Limited acquired 70% interest in S. The remaining 30% is NCI in S. Now this one has nothing to do with tax because your adjustment is already after tax basis. <coughs> so this 30% represent NCI in S limited. Now that's all our worksheet entries. Now you need to post all these entries in the worksheet, right? So under this adjustment column, you have RC entries for the plant, right? And you also have pre-acquisition entries, two pre-acquisition entries, also includes intergroup elimination entries. Yeah. What else? Uh, oh, that's all. <laughs> now, once you get all these adjustments, you will find the group equity balance. Yeah. And then prepare NCI entries, so all the NCI related adjustments here. Subtract the NCI share of the group equity, then you will get parents' position. Yeah. Good news, I won't ask you to prepare a worksheet so exam questions are all in form of MCQ. So no worksheet preparation is required. 
Now, our focus on is how to prepare the worksheet entries. Yeah. So this can generate automatically by the uh, spreadsheet. All right, exercise. <coughs> okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on that. Then I will ask you to answer this question. So look at the requirements carefully, okay? The question here asks you to identify B and C I interest in the post acquisition rating earnings of Gamma. Who is Gamma? That is a grant child company entity. <coughs> so D, last one. Let's see if any different opinion. Chang Yi, Wang Chang Yi. Yeah. Which one you think that is right? Uh, you you choose a C, right? Okay. Uh, let's have, ask one more. Hong Ren, what's your opinion? You also choose D. Okay. Now let's have a look at which one is right, okay. and why C is not the right answer. Okay. Now let's start with the D and C I in gamma. Uh, so how to find D and C I in gamma? Beta owns 60% in gamma, right? One minus 60%, very good. So D and C in gamma is 40%. And now let's find out the D and C interest in the post acquisition. Now, now I believe when you choose C, you are using 40% multiplied by 400, is that right? Oh, more than that, <laughs> sorry. So how do you get C? Oh, 250,000 multiplied by total NCI interest in gamma. You include I and C I interest as well, okay? So be careful. The question here asks for D and C I only. So D and C I is only 40%. And the post acquisition return earnings, so we need to exclude the return earnings balance on acquisition day, right? So this is the balance you have at the reporting day. This is the acquisition day balance, which is pre-acquisition day equity. To find the post-acquisition day return earnings, we use reporting day return earnings balance minus the acquisition day return earnings. So the changes here representing the post-acquisition return earnings, which is 250,000. Now 250,000 multiplied by 40%, you got 100, so you choose D. <coughs> Any question? Let me know. So far, so good? Okay. Now, let's look at the next one. But this time is C, right? Now why is the C? Because it's here for the total NCI interest in the post acquisition. So if you choose C, this time is right. Now what is the total NCI in gamma? Now that includes both of the DNCI and INCI. The DNCI we have figured out previously, 40%, using one minus 60%, you got 40%. What about INCI? To find the INCI, we first of all have to identify the DNCI in beta, right? The DNCI in beta is one minus 80%, that is 20%. Now it is this part that has an indirect non-controlled interest in gamma. So using 20% multiplied by 60%, which is equal to 12%. Right? 
So therefore, the total NCI interest in gamma, that will be 52%. And the NCI, uh, sorry, gamma's post acquisition equity balance, we allocate to be both DNCI and INCI, which in other words, both of these two parties receive a share of the post acquisition equity of gamma. So your allocation therefore is based on 52%. So 52% multiplied by 250,000 CE like this. Mm -hmm. Because this is a reporting date, retail earnings balance. This is retail earnings balance on acquisition date, which is a pre-acquisition retail earnings. 450,000 includes the equity balance of the retail earnings uh, sorry, on acquisition date. The question here asks for the post acquisition earnings. What is a post? The retail earnings movement during the post acquisition period, after the acquisition date. So this accurately relates to the changes in retail earnings balance, right? This is the balance you have right now. This is the balance you have at the report, uh, at acquisition date. Now the difference represents the post acquisition rating. Which in other words, 450,000, the balance includes the equity, uh, retail earnings balance you have on the acquisition date. And that is a pre-acquisition. If the question here asks for the total NCI in the, in the retained earnings, that would be a different question. This is a post acquisition. What's your understanding of post? What do you mean by post? After acquisition. That's right. You said after acquisition. What is 200,000 stand for? Uh, That's right. That's pre acquisition, after right? So using 450 minus 200,000, you can find after the acquisition date. Mm -hmm. Equity balance. Mm -hmm. Not fair value. This is a movement in the retail earnings. On the acquisition day, you have 200,000 balance. Now you have 450,000 balance. The difference representing the changes in retail earnings during the post acquisition period, and that is the post acquisition retail earnings. Yeah, that's what I'm going to change the question now. What if the question here is the total NCI interest in the retained earnings of gamma at the reporting date. What is your answer? Now this one will be a bit more challenging. You think about that? Not that simple. If it's that simple, I won't say it's a challenge, right? <laughs> Think about that. DNCI, only DNCI receive a share of the all equity. So you have to do separately. You have to do two different calculations. DNCI shares, 40%, right? Multiply by 450,000. Because these parties receive a share of all the equity of the subsidiary, including both pre and post. And these 450,000 include both pre and post, right? All these can be allocated to DNCI. For INCI, it's 12%, right? And only receive share of the post acquisition. So therefore, INCI multiply 50 minus Okay, so this is the INCI issue. Now let's get the final answer here.
It's 13? My ass is different. Uh, 250, right? 250 multiplied by 0 0.12. 30. I share of rated earnings is equal to 30 plus 180, that is 200. Oh, none of these option is correct. <laughs> this is a variation of the question, not the original question. This is the original question. <laughs> now, but in the exam, I may give you option. None of the above. None of these. And that may be the right answer, right? That may be. So it depends on whether you can work out the right answer from your side. <laughs> now, this one a bit more challenge. Okay. Now, I would consider this type of question is simple, and this is um, difficult, okay, or the medium up to difficult level. <coughs> now, does it make sense to you now? Okay, so re look at the requirements very careful, okay? Whether ask for the share of total acquisition equity or share of the equity retain earnings, uh, for example, retain earnings at reporting date. So only D and C, I remember that, only D and C I receive the share of the pre-acquisition equity of the stock D. Okay. All right, yes. Mm. There's no such a situation. Only when you made the wrong, wrong answer. That is the only situation. Wrong answer. <laughs> so what's the po what you're using? Four fifty thousand times fifty-two percent doesn't make sense because that four fifty thousand include pre-acquisition equity two hundred thousand, and we cannot allocate the pre-acquisition equity balance to I and C I. That's why the calculation itself is a mistake. <coughs> it's a mistake. <coughs> because pre-acquisition equity balance, right, can only be allocated to D and C I. What this 52% represent? Well, it includes both D and C and I and C I. No worries. Let's look at this one. Mm. Now look at the requirement carefully, all right? Let's have a look at a different opinion. Yu Pei, Wang Yu Pei. Yeah, what do you think? Oh, you also choose B. You trust the land king, right? <laughs> All right, now let's look at this calculation. Is B the right answer? Okay, yes, it is, right? Now, we need to find out the I and C I interest in the post accurate earnings. We need to find two components. What is I and C I in? One limited, we use 25%, one minus 75%, right? 25% multiplied by 80%. So the INCI in the grant chart company is 20%. So anyone get trouble to get this 20%? Just raise your hand, let me know, okay? You can explain that. So one minus 25%, that is DNCI in chart company, John Limited, right? This part has an indirect non-controlled interest in the grant chart company, one limited. So that's why using 25% multiply 80%, you have an INCI interest of 20%. Now we need to find out the post-acquisition return earnings. So what is the post-acquisition return earnings? 
this piece, how to get how to answer this really here only. The really here only is balance. The acquisition date will change, right? right? So this is your reporting date written on the side. And that is written on your balance you have on the acquisition date, which is also the pre-acquisition date. Now, this amount included here, right? So the difference representing the post-acquisition written earnings, then we are going to multiply this post-acquisition earnings with 20%. To show what is the NCI and CI share of the post acquisition return earnings, that is 265. Any question here? Yes, uh, no, no, if you just ask returnings, I will see only have a share of the post. The answer is due. Due B. Even the question here asks for the INCI interest in the retained earnings of one limited. Your answer is due B. Because INC only receive a share of the post acquisition return earnings. INCI does not receive a share of the pre acquisition return earnings. So your answer remains the same. Okay. Indirect. Indirect. Direct NCI receive both pre and post. Not like that. This is a total NCI. It's different. Total NCI includes DNCI and the INCI. That's what we call total, right? So the question here for ask for INCI, then 20% times this amount, right? Mm -hmm. If the question asks for the DNCI, then it will be with the DNCI in in long a chunk long limited with the DNCI in of 20 percent, right? Mm -hmm. Oh it's still 20 percent. So 20 percent times oh the hand up. If the DNCI share of the post acquisition <coughs> return is still 20% of the number sold, okay? It's just accident, okay? It's just coincidence. Now, if the question here asks for the total NCI, then 40% multiplied by this, right? And if the question asks for the total NCI interest in the retail earnings, then the calculation will be like this. We need to be able to deal with different scenario, right? On the different circumstance. So the key is to first of all understand the requirement. It's still twenty percent because the one line is eighty percent, twenty percent, right? Twenty percent times is to, to get the same number. Now, you first of all, you need to understand what is a DNCI, what is a INCI, what is a total NCI. You have to figure out this, okay? And then you need to understand what do you mean by post-acquisition equity, what is pre-acquisition equity. And once you figure out this concept, then you can do the calculation properly. Okay? So instead of trying to memorize everything, you first of all have to make sure you understand the concept for each different component. And then you can establish the logic when you do the calculation. <coughs> 1,380,000, that's right. 
Mm. No problem. Okay. Now, now, finally, uh, let's give you a bit this uh, introduction of non-sequential application. Now, this part is not required for our worksheet entry. The worksheet entry is only focused on sequential acquisition. Now, what is a non-sequential acquisition? So we can use this following example to demonstrate that assuming uh, Y acquired its shares in Z and obtain the control interest, okay? So you can see one of the Y's asset is shares in Z or investment in Z. Yeah. Now, later on, X Limited acquired its control interest in Y. Acquired its control interest in Y, okay? Now, if Y is identified as acquired in this business company transaction, we know all the Y's asset must be measured at fair value on the acquisition day. Now this is in accordance with ASB3, right? We learned earlier. Now one of the Y's asset is <coughs> investment in Z limited or, in, or shares in Z limited. And this asset in the record of Y is carried at cost that how much Y paid, right, to acquire the 60% interest in Z. This is carrying Y at cost. However, when X acquired its control interest in Y, all the Y's asset, including its investment in Z Limited, must be measured at fair value. So you can see you need to prepare RC adjustment for the assets, shares in subsidiary or investment in subsidiary. Okay. Now, this will make these worksheet entries a bit more complicated because this is going to affect your pre-acquisition entry as well because pre-acquisition entry is prepared originally based on the cost, right? Yeah. But you guys don't worry about that too much, okay? So we focus on sequential acquisition at this stage. But if you're interested, you can go have a look at uh, going through the textbook. There are some more examples. Now, next week, uh, we have topic seven and eight, right? Now these two are rather simple topics. Now topic seven are also included in your final plan. Now we are going to have a look at different types of the investment. You may have an investment in your associate or you may have an investment in joint venture. So uh, different accounting method will be applied for this type of investment. We call equity accounting method. Okay. Now the equity accounting journal is much easier compared to the consolidation methods. So relatively simple one. So we're going to have a look at these in the next week seminar. Okay. Now finally, let's uh, have a look at our in-class question. Now the in-class question is not very complicated. Um, so we're probably going to finish a bit early than scheduled time. I'll just find out the question. Uh, This one probably. Ah, oh, that's the right question. Good, good, good. Okay, mm. now let's look at this together. We got the company ABC on first July year X6 acquired 80% issue share capital of DEF. And on the same day, DEF acquired 60% of issue share capital of XYZ. Now, this is a sequential acquisition, right? Now let's diagram the group structure first. Now if you have multiple subsidiary uh, questions, so I would suggest you to diagram the group structure as a first step. Okay? So when you're reading the question, you already can have this sound. So ABC acquired 80% issue shares of DEF, and DEF acquired 60% uh, shares of X. So prepare this uh, to diagram your group structure so as a first step. And then we move on to look at other information in this question. So you can see the in, for each acquisition, so we have the 
equity balance of subsidiary DEF XYZ on acquisition day, okay? And uh, then for the year ended 30 June 20, uh, 30 June 20 X8, so this is our current year ended. So you can see the acquisition day is X6, and the current year is ended on 30 June X8, so that's two years since the acquisition. Okay. Now what happened during the current year ended on 30 June X8? So we have both these two subsidiary report after tax profit, right? Okay. And no dividend paid or declared during the year. Yeah. And here are the balance sheet information of the subsidiary, DFXYZ on 30 June X7. Now this equity balance of DFXYZ is the opening balance for the current year. Now this information is important to help you get step two NCI calculation, right? Now question here only asks for the NCI interest in XYZ. Oh, let's forget about DEF, right? So nothing need to do with DEF. They just focus on XYZ equity balance on acquisition day. The changes in equity balance of XYZ from acquisition day to the beginning of the current year. And finally, the movement in the XYZ equity balance in the current period. Now, so based on this uh, diagram, we already know the NCI in X, right? Total 52%. Now, includes 40% DNCI and then 12% of INCI, okay? So in total 52%. But only DNCI receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity. Only DNCI receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity. Now, INCI receive a share of the post-acquisition equity only, okay? So what is a DNCI share of share capital retained earnings? This will be 40% times 1 million, right? 400,000. And for retained earnings, 40% of 600,000. All right, so just keep in mind, only DNCI receive a share of the pre-acquisition equity of the subsidiary, okay? DNCI. So therefore, you need to multiply 40%, not 52%. It should be 40%. Right. Now, then move on to step two. The changes in XYZ equity from acquisition day to the beginning of the current year. Okay, so what is the changes in, uh, no change in share capital, right? Um, as a revenue reserve, no, uh, general reserve. The general reserve, there's 300,000 difference. How are you gonna allocate that? So your allocation is based on 40% or 52%. Where you think, you think? It's not here today. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You think, so your allocation is based on 40% DNCI or 52% total NCI for the changes. 50, 52%. Very good. Okay. So we should allocate based on 52%. Well done. So 52% of the changes in general reserve, that is 52% multiplied by 300,000. And then you look at retained earnings. What about retained earnings? Uh, there's a changes in retained earnings of 100,000, right? 100,000. Okay. Yan Chen. Yan Chen. Zimu, Yang Zimu. So for the changes in retained earnings, we allocate based on 40% or 52%. percent. 52%, right? Why 52%? Because both DNCI, INCI receive a share of the post-acquisition. That's why. 
okay? So both DNCR INC have this issue of the post acquisition happening, okay? Now, what about current year? Well, current year X was that report after tax profit 490,000. So how we do the allocation? Qing Yang, Zhang Qing Yang, absent, okay. Ruo Qi, Zhang Ruo Qi, Zheng Zhongxu, okay. So this 490,000. Your allocation to the NCA is based on 40% or 52%? Is it 52%? Again, this is a post acquisition, right? Equity of the subsidiary. So both DNCI, INCI receive a share of that. Well done, okay. Now, then we have our analysis. Now let's complete our calculation. So you can see for pre-acquisition share capital rate in earnings, so our allocation is based on 40% only because only DNC receive share of that. For the post-acquisition movement in January 3rd, you can see both DNC and INC receive share of that. So DNC allocation based on 40%, INC based on 12%, right? And for the post-acquisition rate in earnings, again, we allocate to both DNC and INC. Okay. Current year profit also relates to the post-acquisition equity. We allocate to both DNCI and INCI. Right. Now, then we total these up, you will get DNCI share of the equity of the subsidiary, right? And if you total these up, you will get INCI share of the equity of subsidiary. And specifically, INCI share of the post acquisition equity of the subsidiary. Okay? So add these two numbers together, you will get total NCI share of the subsidiary's equity balance that reflected in the consolidated accounts. Right. Now going through this calculation one more time and let me know if there's any question. Right, so I'll just check up the rest of attendance, okay? Zhe uh, Yu, Zhe Yu. Xiu Yun, Xiu Yun, Lu Xiu Yun. Guan Tian, Guan Tian is Bahati. Okay. All right, that's that. So, if anyone got a question from this practice? Let me know. So two things you need to keep in, keep in your mind. DNCI, receive share of both pre and post equity balance of the subsidiary. That reflect in the consultant cost. INCI, only receive share of the post acquisition equity. Okay, so if you keep this rules principle in your mind, I believe that you will be able to do most of the calculation properly. And make sure you understand the requirements. So always look at the requirements carefully. So what the question asks you to do. Okay. And pay attention to the year, the financial year end, right? Pay attention to the acquisition day, to pay attention to the transaction day. So the date is always the important information in your financial accounting subject. Yeah. All right, guys. Now that's all for today. So we oh we finish early. Now if you have any other question, feel free to stay. So the rest of time will be your consultation. If you have any question, so you can come stay and ask me. Okay. <coughs> so I'll see you next week. Then. So check, keep eyes on your my UNSW to check your um, exam related information. Okay. So I will provide more information in the next week seminar.